Let's talk about anelasticity and viscoelasticity. What are these two things? Well, anelasticity down here, that is time-dependent elastic response, meaning if I pull on something, it will eventually stretch, but it doesn't happen all immediately. It's not like you immediately get strain. It has to sort of build up over time. And when you let, some, when you let go of a strained object, it slowly goes back to its initial state. It's not instantaneous, right? So the curve would look like this. Here's our stress, stress versus strain, right? So in a normal material, when you apply a stress, you expect strain to immediately follow, right? So an elastic material, that would be the dotted line here. It Immediately you get all your elastic strain. It stays there. And the second you remove your stress, you lose all of your elastic strain, right? Totally simple. It's not that simple in viscoelastic and anelastic materials. In a viscoelastic and anelastic thing, it's time dependent, right? So you can get this time dependent increase where it initially strains a little bit, but if you hold it, it keeps on straining and it sort of asymptotes to a value. And then when you kill that stress, it doesn't drop all the way down, it drops to here and then it slowly decays back towards zero, right? That's an example of anelasticity or viscoelastic behavior. Now, you can also get viscous behavior. And a viscous behavior, the material flows as if it was a liquid. Liquid. So you apply the stress and your strain just slowly increases until you stop the stress and then it just stays there, right? So think of honey. As you pour it, it's just going to keep on slowly forming and then when you take away gravity acting on it, it just stays there. It doesn't like bounce back up into the bottle, right? So that would be a viscous material, something that is now basically a liquid, right? It has a, uh, a liquidy type response to it, right? By the way, if you want to see a really cool example of anelastic behavior, this guy at Georgia Tech does work on fire ants, um, and they're pretty wild, so I'll share that link in the, in the description of this video, right? Well, how about this question? <clears throat> we know that both temperature and strain rate can influence same uh, mechanical response in the same ways, right? Increasing uh, strain rate, decreasing temperature, both makes it look more like a brittle material. So if both of those things influence mechanical properties, how do we decouple them? Well, the, the trick here is that you're going to fix one of the variables and then vary the other, and then do that for the other variable, right? So you fix one, vary the other. So for example, you might fix temperature, do everything at the exact same temperature, but then strain the polymer at different strain rates, right? Or you could go the other way. You could strain them at the exact same rate, but do it as, as a function of a bunch of different temperatures. And what you'd get is something like this. So here they're showing the stress relaxation modulus, right? So the modulus is just the stress as a function of time divided by your strain, right? So it's just Young's modulus. They've just solved for Hooke's law over here, but they're doing it as a function of time, okay? Well, we will talk more about this next chapter, right? Um, so think of this like, like modulus. This on the y-axis is basically your Young's modulus. And they're doing this as a function of time held, right? Or as a function of temperature when they did this, right? All these different curves were done at different temperatures, right? And if they hold them for different times, you can see these different behaviors. Now what you can do is you can actually join all these curves together. And that's what they've done here. This is called a glassy transition curve. The glassy transition curve shows how a material can start up here having a really high modulus and how it can bend down to become a rubbery material and eventually a material with no modulus that just flows like a liquid, right? That is the glassy transition, right? In fact, there is a glassy transition temperature. The glassy transition temperature right around here where you start to go from a glassy state towards a more leathery region and then eventually a rubbery plateau. The glassy transition is defined as the temperature at which the viscosity is equal to a specific value, 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds. We've just sort of decided that that's the viscosity where it's not really a glass anymore. It's starting to look more like a rubbery or something that's flowing, right? So that's the viscosity. Again, more on viscosity in the next chapter. But these sort of plots are really important for materials because um, many materials will exhibit this behavior. At low temperatures or high strain rates, they look like glasses. Um, at high temperatures or low strain rates, they might look like a liquid that is actually flowing, right? Um, anyways, that's glassy transition temperature. You could draw these, by the way, for different polymers. Let's draw these for a couple different polymers, right? What would a cross-linked polymer look like, a cross-linked rubber? Well, a cross-linked rubber, it's going to exhibit a glassy transition temperature. 
But once it becomes a rubber, it's never going to flow, right? It's cross-linked. So this would be our cross-linked rubber. If you heat it up, it will just eventually burn, but it won't flow. It doesn't, it doesn't melt like other polymers. Now, compare that to another polymer, something that is not cross-linked, right? Let's take a low versus a high molecular, low molecular versus a high molecular weight atactic polymer, okay? They might look just like the purple one here, but one will start to flow at a low temperature and one will start to flow at a high temperature. Which one's which? The higher molecular weight one has more regions where the chains can be lined up, so this would be the high molecular weight atactic polymer. This one would be the low molecular weight atactic polymer. Now, what would a crystalline um, a isotactic polymer look like? Remember, isotactic, that means that all the groups are on the same side, which makes it much more crystalline. So that one's going to look like this. It's going to have a higher modulus overall, but it's also eventually going to look like a material that flows because it will melt because it's not cross-linked, right? So these glassy transition curves are really useful for understanding behavior of different polymers, especially as a function of their conditions they can be tested under. Something else that we should know about viscoelasticity is that you can get viscoelastic creep since things are flowing over time. If you let it sit for a long time, you can get strain accumulating. Um, that's why you'll see like these flat stoppers on tires. If you've got a show car that you're not going to be driving it very often to change the tires, it's going to sit parked. Maybe a camper might have these too. They put these flat stoppers to prevent viscoelastic creep from giving you lumpy tires that then don't drive well, right? It prevents flat spots in, in tires, okay? Um, creep is more pronounced in low crystallinity polymers. The more crystalline your polymer is, the more it's going to resist deformation over time and so if you have low crystallinity it like rubbers then it's going to be more likely to have this happening